Okay, this is video number nine, and it's about the synapse. It's about the process of synaptic transmission, including reference to neurotransmitters, excitation, and inhibition. In video eight, we looked at the nerve cell, and we looked at how information is transferred around the body via nerve cells. Nerve cells are long and thin, and action potentials travel down the axons of nerve cells, and in so doing, they transfer information around the body. When the action potential reaches the end of the axon of a nerve cell, it reaches something called uh, uh, the axon terminal button, and then the information is transferred to the dendrite of the next nerve cell across a synapse. And that's what we're looking at um, in this video. It's about that gap between the terminal button of one nerve cell and the dendrite of the next. And that gap is called the synaptic cleft or the synaptic gap. Action potentials can't tra travel uh, across the synaptic cleft. So information is transferred across the synapse via chemical transmission. Uh, what happens is a chemical called a neurotransmitter actually physically diffuses across the synapse, actually physically travels uh, from one side of the synapse to the other. And that happens really quickly. It can happen, you know, 200 times every second. Synapses are really small, about on the order of 20 nanometers across, and that is much smaller than you can actually see with an ordinary conventional optical microscope. If you look at a synapse under an optical microscope, it, it just looks as though the axon terminal button of one nerve cell is joined onto the dendrite of the next one. And synapses actually weren't really observed properly until the 1950s and the development of the electron microscope. Um, electron microscopes can see things which are much, much smaller than a conventional optical microscope. OK, there are two pieces of vocabulary that we do need for this video, presynaptic and postsynaptic. And they're pretty obvious if you think about it. Presynaptic means before the synapse, and postsynaptic means after the synapse. And the presynaptic neuron is the one which delivers information into the synapse. It's the one where the axon terminal button forms the presynaptic membrane. And the postsynaptic neuron is the one that receives information from the synapse. It's the one where the postsynaptic membrane is a part of the dendrite of the next neuron. So let's have a closer look at what actually takes place inside the axon terminal button. Inside the axon terminal button, there are small, tiny sacs called vesicles. And these vesicles contain the neurotransmitter molecules, which are actually going to travel across the synaptic cleft. Now, when an action potential arrives at the axon terminal button, what happens is these vesicles actually fuse with the presynaptic membrane. And as they fuse with the presynaptic membrane, they deposit the neurotransmitter molecules into the synaptic cleft, and then these molecules can then begin their journey across to the other side. They release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. And this process of fusion, where the vesicles become a part um, of the presynaptic membrane, that is called exocytosis. So when they are deposited into the synaptic cleft, the neurotransmitter molecules diffuse across to the other side. What is diffusion? Well, drop one single drop of ink into a bucket of water very, very gently so that it doesn't splash. And immediately, um, you can see the drop of ink start very slowly to spread throughout the water. And no 
No matter how gently you drop the ink in, even if you just place it on the surface of the water, the ink will still start spreading. And the reason for that is because the individual molecules are moving around like crazy and bumping into one another all the time. Uh, and this, the spontaneous motion of molecules due to their movement is called diffusion. Come back in an hour or two's time and the ink will have completely spread throughout the water just as if you mixed it up with a spoon. And it's this process, diffusion, the spontaneous migration of molecules which takes the neurotransmitter molecules across the synaptic cleft. They don't need to be pumped or given a shove or pushed or anything like that, they just spontaneously move across. Now this process takes place really, really quickly. It can take just a couple of milliseconds and the reason for that, of course, is because although diffusion is slow, the synaptic cleft is very, very small. And so it doesn't take long at all for the molecules to diffuse across. Now, on the postsynaptic membrane, there are sites called receptor sites. And the neurotransmitter molecule and the receptor site are like a key and a lock. When the key fits into the lock, when the neurotransmitter molecule fits into the receptor site, then the postsynaptic neuron is activated. Only a particular type of neurotransmitter molecule can fit into a particular type of receptor site. And in this way, when the neurotransmitter fits into the receptor site, when the key fits the lock, information travels across the synapse, it's transferred from the presynaptic neuron into the postsynaptic neuron, and the level of activity in the presynaptic neuron therefore influences the level of activity in the postsynaptic neuron. Incidentally, the way that a lot of drugs work in the brain and in the nervous system is by messing around with synapses. Uh, for example, some drugs uh, block neurotransmitters, block synapses, like, for example, um, sticking a piece of chewing gum into a lock. You can't get the key in. They block the receptor sites. And um, other drugs um, just build up the amount of neurotransmitters in the brain in the synapse in the first place. So those neurotransmitters have uh, an increased effect on the synapse. OK, well, in a moment, we're going to be having a look at the processes of excitation and inhibition. But first, it is time for this week's random psychology fact. This week's random psychology fact is that in 2008, 270 psychologists replicated 100 top psychological studies that had been published, and they found that only half of the studies that were replicated got the same results. That was this week's random psychology fact. Okay, excitation and inhibition. Now, nerve cells are not organised uh, like a daisy chain. It, it's not the case that one nerve cell joins onto the next nerve cell, joins onto the next nerve cell, joins onto the next nerve cell, and so on. In actual fact, each nerve cell receives input from multiple different synapses, and each nerve cell splits and puts input uh, and outputs onto multiple other nerve cells via multiple synapses as well. Think about the way that the dendritic tree is organised. On the dendritic tree, there are multiple, multiple synapses, and each of one of these can come from a separate nerve cell. And at the other end of the nerve cell as well, each axon splits and forms synapses onto, onto many, many different nerve cells. So each synapse is either excitatory or inhibitory. So let's pause for a moment, really to fully understand what is meant by those terms, excitatory and inhibitory. OK. In an excitatory synapse, a high rate of firing, a high firing rate of action potentials 
in the presynaptic neuron leads to a high rate of firing of action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. In other words, if the presynaptic neuron is firing really, really quickly, the postsynaptic neuron will be influenced to fire really, really quickly as well. And if the presynaptic neuron is firing very slowly, that will influence the postsynaptic neuron to follow to, to, to fire really, really slowly as well. In other words, in an excitatory synapse, there is a positive relationship between the activity in the presynaptic neuron and the activity in the postsynaptic neuron. High leads to high and low leads to low. In an inhibitory synapse, that relationship is reversed. So, a high firing rate in the presynaptic neuron, if many, many action potentials are arriving per second in the presynaptic neuron, that will lead to a low firing rate of action potentials in the postsynaptic neuron. And correspondingly, if the firing rate of action potentials in the presynaptic neuron is really slow, uh, that will influence the postsynaptic neuron to raise its firing rate of action potentials. In other words, in, in an inhibitory synapse, there is an inverse relationship between the firing rate of the presynaptic neuron and the firing rate of the postsynaptic neuron. Inhibitory and excitatory synapses work with different neurotransmitters. For example, serotonin, that's a neurotransmitter, tends to have an, inhib an inhibitory effect. Um, serotonin synapses tend to be inhibitory and dopamine uh, tends to have an excitatory effect. Dopamine synapses tend to be excitatory. Excitatory synapses tend to be on the shafts and spines of the dendritic tree, whereas inhibitory synapses tend to be um, on the cell body. So what happens is that in your average nerve cell, you have a wave of excitation arriving from the dendritic tree, and that gets inhibited in the cell body. Excitation is a bit like um, the accelerator pedal um, in a nerve cell, and inhibition is a bit like the brake pedal in a nerve cell, except Unlike in a car, where you've just got one brake pedal and one accelerator pedal, on a nerve cell, you've got perhaps hundreds or thousands of accelerators and, and brake pedals, because each uh, nerve cell receives perhaps thousands of excitatory and inhibitory impulses every second from all of the synapses um, on the dendritic tree and the cell body. And the activity of a nerve cell is determined by the balance between the excitation and the inhibition. And this process is called summation. Summation is the process by which the firing rate, the activity of a nerve cell, is determined by the balance of excitatory and inhibitory input. Okay, so this video has been about the synapse. It's been about uh, synaptic transmission and neurotransmitters and receptor sites, and it has also been about excitation and inhibition, inhibition and it has been about summation.